Future decision making is a, well, the, well, the, the word shared decision making probably first came into use in a 1982 document that was published by the President's Commission when Jimmy Carter was the United States of American President. And it relates to a doc, it, it was in a document written primarily by ethicists and lawyers. And their remit was to look into um, informed decision making or consent for medical procedures. Actually defining it is a bit difficult because it's a term used more in social sciences rather than biomedical sciences and it doesn't have one um, agreed definition. Probably is best described as a process and the process involves a discussion with a patient to identify the chances of benefit or harm from a treatment. Also to identify if there are alternative treatments or options for a patient. To communicate that information to the patient. To then identify the patient's personal perspective on what choice they want to make and then to move into supporting the patient in that choice. Well, in a very narrow way, everything we do as anaesthetists, all our interactions with patients, should involve some degree of shared decision making because uh, it's the patient's body and their fate that's being determined by many of the things that we do. So we're really um, bound and obligated to include the patient and Really, the sharing the emphasis of the word sharing is upon the patient allowing us to participate in the decision making process rather than view the other way around, which I think most people typically view it as we are allowing the patient to share, to we are sharing the decision making process with the patient, but it should be viewed the other way around. And therefore, that then leads on to us understanding that we are predominantly providing information and information in context in a way that the patient can understand. But the, the end point, the decision, is very much remains the patient's. And in parenting medicine, those ideals are just progressed further with the anaesthetist taking on a, a role different to that tradition taken on as an anaesthetist. Or, or another way of looking at it is, in healthcare, the two main things you decide is, do I have a test or investigation, and do I have a treatment? So any investigations or treatments that anaesthetists are involved would be shared decision-making and anaesthesia. And that could be in pre-assessment clinics, it could be for choice of anaesthetic, it could be for decisions um, for epidural analgesia in labour, the, the list is endless. The benefits are for both the patient and society. And clinicians. Yeah, yeah and, and clinicians. Your patients will um, appreciate you more um, as their doctor if you use shared decision making. The evidence, there's a Cochrane review of 182 randomised controlled trials using shared decision making and the brief summary of that is it reduces patients choice for interventions such as surgery and it improves patient satisfaction with their choice. I think patients want shared decision making but different patients want a different shared decision making and this is where it's key when you are trying to identify what the patients want, you're led by what the patients want, not by what you want to inform them of. Well, we mainly start off by having a friendly chat because um, people won't make natural choices in an unnatural environment, and hospitals are clearly in an unnatural environment, quite threatening for patients. So. It's crucial to 
try and take the patient's mind off the current episode, the reason you're seeing them. So in the preoperative assessment clinic, for instance, where we, Mark and I, see patients regularly, the first part of the uh, consultation is one where it's very small talk, um, introducing ourselves, finding out just general life details about the patient, what they like, and it's only towards the end of the consultation, and our consultations in the property assessment clinic are one hour approximately in duration, it's only in the last 20 minutes to half an hour where we start to encroach much more upon the threatening, worrying things that would otherwise put the patient off being involved in the process. Yes, I think that's very true. I mean, your standard medical consultation is more about the doctor and disease than the patient. It's a history, examination, investigations, tests to make a diagnosis or decide a treatment. The shared decision-making consultation is about the patient. Now, the patient needs to change from... The, the patient arrives expecting a medical um, consultation. And you have to gain the patient's trust before they will share information with you or ask you questions. And I think that's particularly true if your relationship with the patient is that of a hierarchical doctor here, patient down here. Patients are unlikely to question you because they're intimidated by you. So the key bit of unlocking the patient is to get them to trust you such that they feel comfortable to tell you what they want or to ask you questions. So although in this the interview you're currently conducting right now, there's we may be coming across as perhaps not particularly natural and so on. We, we, we this isn't how we do it. No, it's not how we do it. So in, in our own environment, we're much more smiley, chatty, da 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 whereas in this particular interview, we're being a bit more formal in our responses. But And so in a way, uh, Abigail, who's behind the lens, yes. you, viewers who cannot see her, um, would be needing to make us more at ease to get that sort of natural decision-making. Well, I'll give you some examples of how you unlock patients. You smile, you're polite, um, you deal with what questions they've got first of all, and then you often go off on tangents um, at the right time to talk about things that are not related to the patient's illness, say, or disease, um, but talks about the patient. So we use patient's accents or surnames and start asking them about the background of their surname and where they're from. Or we used to use a trick where on our computer screen we could work out what day a patient was born and you'd throw this in at the right moment and you'd get a smile and the patient would start talking about their place of birth and their family. And those sort of aspects to the consultation I think gain the patient's trust. We certainly needed those tricks early on and but now most patients there just be a natural conversation and stuff mm, would arise <clears throat> and, and you don't really need to make any uh, artificial uh, efforts in, in triggering that. Occasionally you do, but most of the time we don't. I, th I, think I think different patients have a different style and I think patient decision aids will help some patients in making decisions but can't be forced on patients. I think ideally you'd like them to get some information and some simple decision aids before you see them so that they come with the concept of shared decision making. Uh, then I think there are more specific procedures that we could develop anaesthetic decision making aids, um, particularly say on uh, something like a, a regional anaesthetic technique. In the role of the anaesthetist in preoperative assessment clinic, pre assessment clinic where we um, have two types of consultation. One's the very straightforward discussion about anaesthetic techniques and so on, and the other one is really sitting there not as an anaesthetist at all, um, but as a preoperative counsellor, somebody who's giving people additional information, a lot of which is surgery based, and there are quite a few um, video-based shared decision-making aids available um, through NHS websites that are quite useful 
and they are procedures for specific um, total knee replacements, AAA screening, AAA repair, and a couple of others. They are quite useful, although you don't want to spend the consultation looking at those because they take time to view, maybe an hour. So, if you're going to use, incorporate those into the process, they need to be made available to the patient. And, that, yeah. and they, they do come with an evidence base that indicates they, they help patients in their decision making. I think they're also becoming more complex, um, which is good in that you can have computerised, um, uh, almost like apps, where patients can go into them and there are bo dialogue boxes saying, this is a decision making point, or here you can click on different parts of the screen to get more information. And you can also tailor the information. So you, you patients don't have to ask every question if they don't want, or you can lead you can give people leading questions about how much information they want. There, there's only been, <coughs> in, for people with coronary artery disease, there's only been one randomised controlled trial of what was a video-based patient decision aid, and the use of that reduced the rate of uptake of coronary artery um, angiography and coronary artery bypass coronary oh. Uh, and there's only been one of those, and that was only 200 patients. And if you think about all the bypass grafting, all the percutaneous interventions done on people's coronary arteries, and then think, well, if we use something like this, we'd reduce the number of people who had these invasive inve investigations and procedures. It's crazy not to use them, and yet we don't routinely. I think. What I think we've learned over the last few years, because we started very early on concentrating on um, the estimate of the risk, and I think certainly I, I feel that we've now learned, having identified what we think a patient's risk is, we then need to probe how they would like that information, or if they would like that information. And their pa patients vary. If you come across somebody, say, with an actuarial background, they may want um, a, a detailed discussion about numbers, whereas other patients may not want to talk about risk. If they don't, you do have to probe why, and that may find you may find the key to how they're making decisions or uh, help them with their decisions. So, while risk is risk or chance of benefit and harm are important, they're not the sole part of the consultation. And we do know that when they are being discussed, um, they're often communicated quite poorly. Um, there's been some work by a doctor called Gigerinzer, who's based in Switzerland. He's written quite a few pieces in the BMJ, he's written a few books and so on, showing that the way um, the chance of something happening is framed affects how somebody understands what is being communicated to them. And you could communicate the same statistical data, the same numerical information, the understanding of which is completely dependent upon the way that it's presented. So there's absolute risk, relative risk, frequency, which is perhaps the best way of communicating the chance of something happening, which is you take a thousand people, this happens to them, so many people in this group have X, Y, and Z outcomes, and you can do that for some for people taking choice A and choice B, and compare the different outcomes and how often they happen. That's probably the simplest and most straightforward way of presenting information. If you want to mislead people, the best way of misleading people is to use uh, relative risk for one outcome and absolute risk for another outcome, because. The framing of those two pieces of information means that the relative risk will make the outcome appear much more likely to happen, and the absolute risk will make that the chance of that thing appear less likely to happen. So, if I were biased and I wanted you to take up this treatment, I would say the relative chance of you having a bad outcome is halved if you have this, whereas the chance of a the treatment causing a bad outcome is increased by one percent. It's possible that that absolute increase in risk, that 1% chance of something bad happening to you because of the treatment, might exceed the half reduction of mm. the 
that outcome. So it all depends upon the way yeah. something is framed. It, it, it does. I, I think there's you can learn and, and, and improve your ability to communicate risk, but I think too much focus has been put on risk in shared decision making and not enough on the whole consultation. Um, for example, you need to identify what the expectations, of, say a patient is going for an operation, what the expectations the patient has from that operation. You need to assess whether you think they will achieve it and you need to think what are the downsides to that patient. And it, is, it often isn't talking about a mortality risk. It's more about trying to estimate, is this person going to be uh, pleased with their decision to have a procedure, or are they going to regret it? And I find more and more I'm moving away from mortality discussions to chance of achieving what you want without harm. And to support Mike here, the, particularly when the numbers that we have on mortality or whatever are usually the completely wrong outcomes anyhow, so at best they'll mislead. For instance, talking about your chance of being dead in 30 days' time is a useless thing to decide whether or not to have a procedure. Lunar cycle mortality. Not many people make decisions based on the moon. I, I think it's difficult to teach in a lecture. I think a workshop is better, but I think what you shouldn't be videoing us in this discussion, you should be videoing us doing a shared decision making with consultation a with, with a patient. And you would learn whether we're doing it well or bad. And I think you'd also, you know, I, we tried with a definition of shared decision making that I don't think was a very good one. It's, it's something when you when you know about it and you see it, you know it's happening. But until you've seen it, it's difficult to describe. I think shared decision making it will grow and develop in all health, all aspects of healthcare. And I think it it will be popular when people start to use it because. It gets you over those difficult decisions when you are uncomfortable with a patient's choice. And where you move to is if the patient has been provided the right information, has understood that, and has expressed a view of why they want something, you are more comfortable in, in say, doing a procedure, even though you're uncertain it's the best choice. And, and the mor mortality and morbidity meetings that you subsequently have about patients who've had a bad outcome feel very different when you know that you have spent time and other people have spent time with the patient and their family discussing realistically the outcomes that they may experience following surgery, both good but also the bad ones. And if they're unfortunate and have a bad outcome, you feel quite different, which is why I said earlier that shared decision making is good for the clinicians as well as for patients. Yes.